With Dordme, Buyoso proposes a space for all those seeking transcendence, um, a sort of queer realm for the questioning of being. Uh, in a section of her article titled Notes About Spirituality in Mexican Literature, Garcia Godoy mentions other novels, including works by Carlos Fuentes, um, and she states that, quote, Several writers consider these matters through their fiction, representing the vitality of Mexican spirituality, animated by pre-Columbian beliefs and practices, and sustained by popular Catholicism and contemporary culture." End quote. Buyosa builds upon these spiritual themes by questioning the relationship of sexuality and gender. The novel attempts to unify the um, cosa partida, the, the divided thing, which is personified in its protagonist, and obliterate the binary pairings of elements through transcendence. Through a reading of Duerdeme, we will note how Buyosa resists the standard theoretical dichotomies. In particular, she disturbs or queers the relationships of sacred, profane, male, female, and finite, infinite. In this talk, or in the chapter that it belongs to, I discuss how the, tech ren the text renders indispensable pre-existing types of what Eve Sedgwick refers to as, quote, bipolar transitive relations, um, such as self, other, subject, object. Um, in Sedgwick's last book, she laments how theoretical frameworks continue to operate within a schema of counter-opposed pairings. The protagonists experience refused definition in a binary mode, highlighting the necessity of this trans rhetoric when reading the text. However, it must be noted that this type of spiritual mestizaje or hybridity does not glorify it. The violence of the conquest represents a rupture that seeks to destroy the sacred, whereas the search for the sacred element has been lost, that has been lost represents a type of spiritual reconquest. Um, because of time constraints, I'm going to focus on just a couple ways that Buyosa queers her vision of this spiritual history. Um, and the first is, as I've already sort of discussed, through the gender and sexuality of her protagonist, um, whom she has described as a desanctified pseudo-Christ. So Claire disregards any typical concepts of sin in the Christian sense. Um, she works as a prostitute in France before going to the New World without any noted guilt. Um, she has sex with both women and men. Uh, she does not subjugate her will to men at any time. Um, clearly, Buyosa in no way develops her uh, desanctified pseudo-Christ as this established male Christ figure. Um, and during our first contact with Claire, she is dressed in men's clothing. Though when an indigenous servant undresses her, we come to, to find out that, quote, she finds me and glances over me. Yes, I'm a woman. Now you've seen it, end quote. The second way I believe that Buyosa queers the spiritual history is through the curing ritual that is performed on Claire. During what the characters in the novel call the curación, an indigenous woman who Claire first believes is named Juana and later finds out is named Ines, which is important because um, Ines de la Cruz is, is sort of framing the whole text with the epigraph to the novel. Um, so Ines slices him with a stone and pours sacred water into his veins. So the blood that was once um, in his body is then taken out and replaced with this pre-Columbian sacred water. Um, Buyosa has called this curación, quote, a feminine baptism, a baptism via penetration, internal, intimate, end quote. Instead of the traditional Christian baptism between two men, uh, Jesus and John, Buyosa queers this foundational myth by shifting the agency into a woman's hands. Further, when Ines replaces Claire's blood with water, the water comes from pre-Columbian times, which begins to complicate notions of ethnicity because Claire is now sustained by an indigenous past and is himself developing a new indigenous identity. Um, so I'd like to briefly just conclude uh, by saying that I'm interested to hear what people have to say uh, about how I use the term queer and, and how I'm developing it uh, in relation to, to ethnicity and, and gender, um, because there is sort of this non-heteronormative sex in the text, but I'm clearly expanding it to mean many other things. Um, and I actually got a question about another chapter uh, that I presented on. Someone asked me, you know, is the moment of queer studies over? So what is the role of queer studies now? Um, and people politically have a lot of, a lot of problems with it and find it problematic. Um, and so I definitely want to thank the organizers for, for creating a space where it could be talked about, because I think there is definitely a role for queer studies. Um, and it presents a lot of interesting questions. 
Um, and as opposed, as Janelle was saying, as opposed to people being shocked about it in general, I think that sort of the academic community might be sick of it and sick of hearing everything, you know, querying religion or, you know, querying this or so. Um, I think that for me and for my work, there is a really important role, but is that role definitely and its future related to expanding what we mean by queer and how we use it? Thank you, Beth. And now we have Colleen Farrell, who's a women's and gender studies major at Williams College with the limits of a patchwork America, representing gay identities in the Names Project AIDS Quilt, 1987 to 1993. This is also a section of a chapter of my thesis. So um, just to contextualize it a bit, um, more broadly, I'm interested in the ways that AIDS was constructed as a gay disease during the 1980s and how um, gay men responded to that construction and also to, to demonstrate to the nation um, the devastation that AIDS wrought within gay communities, but also to contest the notion that AIDS was a gay disease. Um, in this chapter, I'll focus on um, the Names Project AIDS Quilt. The Names Project AIDS Quilt was begun in 1987 by Cleve Jones, a gay AIDS activist based in San Francisco, who was involved in radical activism with Harvey Milk during the 1970s. By the mid-1980s, Cleve Jones wanted to find a way to grieve for and memorialize gay men who died of AIDS and to demonstrate to the nation how AIDS and the lack of government response to AIDS were devastating his community. To do so, he began the AIDS quilt. The quilt is made of individual panels handcrafted by families, lovers, friends, aid service providers, and even strangers, sewn together into groups of eight. My work examines the name Project AIDS Quilt at four distinct, albeit intertwining, political levels. At each of these levels, the quilt speaks as a text itself, while its meaning is simultaneously dictated by the official discourse of the quilt. Though I won't have time today to discuss each of these levels, I want to quickly outline them for you before focusing in on the quilt as a memorial in its entirety. First, I look at the quilt as a physical site of politics, showing that the quilt served as a vehicle for organizing and galvanizing activists and raising money for aid service organizations. Next, I examined the quilt as a memorial in its entirety, demonstrating that the quilt represented the enormity of the epidemic, highlighted government inaction, and allowed for collective memorial and collective memory making, especially for gay men. At this level, the quilt has a different meaning than when we do a close reading of specific panels. Third, I examine how through the non-hierarchical juxtapositions of wildly different representations of people with AIDS, the quilt created space for a subversive representation of a pluralistic America. Finally, I examined the individual quilt panels, which represented each person with AIDS as an individual person and allowed for an especially wide range of gay expression. At each of these political levels, the quilt made hugely important contributions to AIDS activism, but each were nevertheless limited in various ways. <clears throat> the pluralistic and anti-homophobic vision of the quilt was most limited by Cleve Jones's attempt to fit the lives and deaths of people with AIDS most especially gay men, into a mainstream cultural discourse of the Reagan era, a pro-family nationalistic discourse. It was also limited, as well as, ma as well as made possible, by the very medium of a quilt, which relied on gendered and nostalgic renderings of American history. This paper argues that the same discourses that popularized the quilt also limited Jones's pluralistic and anti-homophobic vision. In this presentation, I'll focus on the ways in which Jones incorporated his claims to American identity and notions of femininity into the quilt as a memorial in its entirety. Rather than focusing explicitly on the ties between AIDS and gay communities, even though he was critically interested in those ties, Jones chose to stress the American identities of those um, of gay men who died, in, uh, died of AIDS in America. And while he wasn't solely interested in gay men, that's that's the focus of this paper because that's where um, Jones began this program from that um, standpoint. Um, his choice to focus on American identities resonated with the mainstream cultural discourse of the Reagan era. Jones felt that AIDS activism and awareness needed to spread beyond gay urban centers which were hot spots for activist activities. He wrote, quote, though gays and lesbians were winning political recognition in urban centers without legitimate ties to the larger culture, we'd all, always be marginalized. 